Okay, the next speaker is Russell uh, Broadbent, himself an example of an attribution error, uh, was a pioneer in bariatric surgery in the mid-1980s and as such experienced the full force of medical bullying uh, for the next 20 years, in, the, in fact. He's also a barrister, uh, he's an Air Force pilot, he's a former aero medical specialist, and again, a great privilege to uh, introduce you, Russell. Thanks, Charlie, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here and see such a good crowd. And um, I'm going to talk to you today about um, Shampoo Review, and particularly the, the need for classification of it. I just want to also thank the, uh, my co-authors who's given us some, or collectively got ideas uh, together to make this paper possible. <coughs> I, want, I want to quote uh, Bill Leake uh, straight off, a great uh, Bill Leake who died uh, the other day. The heart of political correctness is the, the denial and avoidance of the truth and the manipulation of human behaviour by regulation. I think we're starting to see that as a true statement. Now, why the topic of Shampoo Review? Well, it's at the core of our issues with the health administration at the moment. <clears throat> and um, because of this, the propriety and integrity of health regulation in particular is currently under serious question. <clears throat> um, I've got to disclose my conflicts of interest here. Uh, Charlie's uh, mentioned some of them. I have a vested interest in this topic. Uh, I'm a victim of it. Uh, I'm into at least my 10th year of this. Um, the effects have been quite devastating. The attacks on me continue right up to the present. They never give up. <clears throat> and so my views are biased and coloured by these experiences. So you don't have to believe me, but uh, hey, we'll uh, have a look at them. There are plenty of people before me and others who've been bullied. There's a list of just some of them. Some of them are members here. And um, they're all normal people, most of them. Um, I see Jane Patel's in that list. Uh, he didn't do everything he did, wasn't, wasn't uh, wrong. <clears throat> We've got to mention the honest peer review first up. What is it? It's time honoured. It's independent review of a professional's work. It's got to be 100% factual, 100% honest and 100% relevant. We all agree with that. It's been around a long, long time. <clears throat> it's a time honoured way that we uh, review health professionals too. But our experience shows that sham peer reviews are increasingly used in the current regulatory environment as a prelude to disciplinary measures or litigation. <clears throat> There's many questions to answer, and I'll try and do some of them today uh, for you, and uh, including why this need for classifying sham peer review. The reason is, of course, there's a lot of ignorance, confusion and serious concerns exist about it. <clears throat> and people talk about it and uh, it gets a little bit muddy at times. <clears throat> but until we're actually all singing from the same song sheet and get our act together, we will not be in harmony and we won't get other people to understand what we're talking about. <clears throat> First of all, not all complaints are genuine, of course. Even genuine complaints are not always factual and are not always justified. But we're concerned today about those complaints, whether they're justified or not, but they're badly handled. <clears throat> because sham peer review and shams can do occur at any of these stages in the handling of a complaint, from the evaluation, the investigation, informal opinions which are obtained, determinations made uh, at some point or other of possible misconduct, then the formal uh, peer review commissioned the proposed actions, what might happen, sanctions, etc., and then formal procedures initiated. At each step of the way, there's plenty of room for errors, deliberate or otherwise. There are so many weak points in this system. At the triage of the complaints, the investigation, the consideration, the decisions which are made in expert reports. The methods employed are invariably breaching the rules of natural justice and due process and procedural fairness and repeatedly involve the same chain of participants making the same errors over and over again. <clears throat> so, working from an accepted universal classification which I will mention a bit later on is the first step in dealing and eradicating the Shampere review phenomenon. 
which is currently devastating <coughs> so many Australian health professionals. I want, in this presentation, I want to focus on um, the components where these uh, expert and peer review opinions are obtained and on the results of the poor investigations, where the integrity of the process uh, is lost. <coughs> the three most important steps being, of course, the investigation of complaints, a peer review, and, of course, the application of the true facts to the, to the actual standards. Now, the real thing is that there are no written standards. There's no standards that any health practitioner can aspire to meet and all standards are really subjective and in a state of constant change. So this is why complaints which turn up two or three years after the event, um, current methods of treatment that may, may be completely <coughs> different. <clears throat> and people take advantage of this uh, fact there are no written standards. All other industries I'm aware of um, uh, have standards which are laid down by statute. <coughs> and, uh, the system that we are forced to be involved in has, uh, would not be stood for, as we'll have to, I think, talk from an engineer later uh, about this sort of thing. <clears throat> so, without such standards, what's happening is the regulatory regimes have effectively prescribed punishment without first defining the crime. Uh, in the Alice in Wonderland situation, uh, Lewis Carroll describes this as the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. And we see the Mad Hatter's Tea Party at work every day. In the rush to control the caring professions, the politically correct social engineers have forgotten all about the democratic process from the Magna Carta over a thousand years ago going forward and to our constitution. Maybe it might even take the High Court of Australia to sort out the answer for this if someone takes the problem there. <clears throat> so why are we in this mess? Well, we have to acknowledge that in Australia, the, the underlying imperative for governments is the protection of the political holy grail. It's the voters' perception of the entitlement to both free and perfectly fault-free health services on demand, regardless of other considerations. This perception has been created since the Whitlam era, and it has to be sought, supported now at all costs in order to retain political office and power. Now, to support this, there's been three important things that have happened in the recent history. The High Court, support for litigation against health professionals, was the, being a simply an extension of the social services net. I think it was Kirby who said this back in the 90s. The changes to the medical insurance law, <coughs> which did away with the mutualisation of indemnity insurers, and now we have the present privately owned system. And thirdly, an instigation of the national law, which we've heard about, is a disaster. So predictably, there's a massive multi-billion dollar for-profit based medical health litigation industry has been developed on the vulnerability of the sham. And there's a huge vested interest out there in this remaining exactly as it is. Of course, it's all been at the expense of the health professions. <clears throat> in particular, peer review has been abused, corrupted and perverted. And such perversions is increasingly used effectively as a weapon in medical legal issues of all sorts. Now, Queensland and New South Wales eclipsed California as the world leaders in medical litigation 10 years ago. <clears throat> Regulatory disciplinary actions against health registrants have followed a parallel pathway. The two phenomena are linked by common facts. The incentives are for the watchdogs and the hangers-on <clears throat> who profit from this for t to find fault when there is none and obtain successful disciplinary orders against registrants when none are justified in order to satisfy those who believe such measures were necessary, our social engineers and some of our politicians, of course. You see, it only takes minor manipulated departures from the real facts and circumstances to permit an allegation of negligence or professional misconduct to be sustained. 
The false perceptions and outcomes can be promoted by dishonest or negligent investigations or deliberate biased misinterpretation at several stages of this process. Distortions, exaggerations or diminution of uh, facts, inventions, denials of fact and circumstances and rearrangement of the sequence or timing of events are all things which distort the whole picture and are critical to the outcomes. If you put these changes before even honest peers, you will get a dishonest answer. <clears throat> and it's more likely to get through and be undetected because they're introduced in an atmosphere which is adversarial rather than inquisitorial as it should be. <clears throat> Sham peer review violates all the common law principles, poses as if it's adherent to them. It's usually malicious and aggressive and it's craftily constructed and presented so it appears legitimate. It's a corruption of the natural justice process. It perverts the stated intentions why the legislation was made. It's a form of manufacturing evidence. Its intention is to pervert it, and it is a crime under every criminal jurisdiction in Australia. We need an urgent need for uniform terminology so that we can oppose and beat the system. With everyone who's involved needs to be aware of the sham peer review phenomenon, understand it, understand the mechanisms, and so we can recognise and address it with the counter-attacks. So we need a terminology. So my talk is really to, about proposing this classification and get people all singing on the same song sheet. <clears throat> it's a bit like the old story about the ducks. If it looks like a duck, Flies like a duck, walks like a duck, it's probably a duck, and the same applies to sham peer reviews. If it looks like a sham peer review, you can bet you it is one. There's always a perpetrator and there's always a victim. Australian legal history is full of this. Wrongful convictions based on manufactured and false evidence, the old kangaroo court. <clears throat> Lindy Charlem Chamberlain, have a talk to her. James Keogh, if anyone's aware of it in South Australia, <coughs> Gordon Wood is fighting his case now through in the New South Wales Supreme Court. That's all five minutes. Five minutes. <clears throat> this mobbing, as we've just heard, it's a team effort. The gangbang approach is likened to tag team wrestling, but the trouble is there's only one victim in the ring with the whole team. This is mobbing. The people who do this, of course, are regulators, hospitals, we've heard about, our universities, training institutions and so forth. The media themselves deserve a special mention because they join in the mod mobbing in this process of false news as Donald Trump has just um, brought to light and the victim suffers psychological imp imprisonment because of it. <clears throat> the victims are easily identified. Uh, Charlie did a, a talk last year in which uh, uh, outline this, so I'm not going to mention much more about that. <clears throat> and the motives of the perpetrators are often quite clear. So now we get come to do how we're going to classify this, and this is probably the, the take-home message. <clears throat> there are two types we can classify, a substantive uh, type of sham peer review, where there are errors of fact and circumstance in the allegations. They're essentially false and yet they've been supported by experts or sham experts. Then there's the procedural form of sham review, where the errors are of the process. <clears throat> procedural fairness, natural justice, the, the prosecution uh, of it and the charges. There's been a denial of it. <clears throat> Each of these can be subdivided into two types. So there's the innocent type, which are pretty rare, where all these mistakes are made, uh, unfortunately. <clears throat> But the other type is the malicious type, which is a common, the common type because of the process behind it. Deliberate and knowing errors of fact and circumstance introduced into the process. The subtypes in those are also the inventive type, where there are pure inventions, and the other type where suppressive, where the real facts are suppressed. So this is a, a summary of it all. Type 1 and Type 2, substantive or procedural. The substantive type, errors of fact and circumstance introduced. Subtype, innocent or malicious. 
and subtyped under that inventive or remitted. The same with the procedural errors. So that gives us eight different classifications we can use. How can we use them? Well, we use them in our defence when we come to uh, defend a, a, a sham peer review. Each subtype needs to be identified and ca characterised and teased out for its cause and effect analysis in your defence. The complexities are frequently deliberately created by the perpetrators with intent to confuse and overwhelm and imprison the victim. <clears throat> the victim needs to understand these errors are a deliberate tactical manoeuvre designed to disadvantage them and distract and deplete the victim for resources. Such categorisation can arm the victim with the facts that demonstrate a failure of the investigative process, which in most cases represent a jurisdictional error, legal term, and potentially renders the entire matter ultra vires or void. Now, the authority for this is on the bottom line. Kirk and the Industrial Relations Commission, 2010, High Court of Australia. This is a very important judgment. If there's one thing you take home, is take this home and look it up, because this shows you the defence to these charges. If we can't get the politicians to change it, then we'll get the High Court to do it, and we go in on the jurisdictional error. Once we've identified them, through this classification of the sham peer review. <clears throat> I'd like to just liken this sham peer review a little bit to the 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act. There are remarkable similarities in how the national law acts and the racial discrimination acts operate on the freedom of speech. I'll repeat what Bill Leake said. The heart of political correctness is the denial and avoidance of the truth and the manipulation of human behaviour by regulation. Thanks very much.